All right, let me introduce Gabe. Gabe is an assistant professor at Toro University Law Center. Prior to that, he was a research manager at the Climate Leadership Council. His primary research focus is climate governance, but he's interested in applying the tools and methods he's developed in that domain to AI safety. Um, Gabe, whenever you're ready, you can share slides. Great. Uh, so thank you all for coming to my talk. As Paul said, I'm, I'm a law professor, um, and so I'm thinking through how uh, tort law can be used to mitigate AI, AI risk, particularly catastrophic AI risk. And so the first step of thinking that through is sort of what, do we have a policy problem here? Um, and, and my analysis I start thinking about that is, is what's, what are the relevant market failures? And I think the key market failure in, in AI is that building and deploying advanced AI systems generates a risk of harm to third parties that isn't reflected in, in the private cost or in, in, in market prices. So there might be harms to parties that aren't buying or selling AI services. Um, and so in economics, that's what's known as a negative externality. Um, and activities that generate negative externalities tend to be overproduced unless parties can efficiently bargain or coordinate to eliminate them. So. I'm having lots of loud parties in my house. Maybe my neighbors can pay me to stop. But if a factory is polluting and harming, you know, 10,000 people, um, then uh, it's going to be hard for all those people in the neighborhood to coordinate, even if even if everyone would be better off if they paid the factory to stop polluting. Um, and so the standard economic response with these kind of externalities is to try to use law and policy to internalize them. Uh, sometimes this is best done with a, what's called a Kabloubian tax. So, you know, climate change is an externality. Greenhouse gases produce a negative externality, but it's hard to trace any particular uh, climate impact harm uh, to a ton of emissions that were produced. And so the, the standard economic prescription there is to, to have something like a carbon tax. Uh, but the harms that are caused by AI systems are much more likely to be concentrated and traceable. So a specific system will harm a specific person. Um, and in theory, at least, liability should work pretty well. A liability of the sort that the tort system is able to impose should work pretty well to internalize that externality. Um, I'll get into what some of the might, challenges might be in a minute, but, but as a baseline theory, that seems like it should work pretty well. I also want to flag before I, I dive in uh, to my specific proposal that there's there's other plausible market failures here that I, I don't want to dismiss. I just want to say I'm not, um, I'm not tackling them with this project. Um, so I think there, there's likely a, a public goods problem associated with alignment research. So public goods are, are non-rival and non-excludable. Once they exist, anyone can use them. It doesn't distract, detract from other people using them. Information is a classic uh, public good. And so there's reason to think that, that the market would underprovide alignment research. Um, there's also an idea that uh, countries or companies might um, be racing forward to get the first to be the first to develop strong AI. This might cause them to move faster than they otherwise would, um, and that these race dynamics uh, are another market failure that's not entirely captured uh, by either the externality or the public goods concern. Um, you might also just worry this isn't really a distinct market failure that other countries uh, might fail to internalize AI risk and externalities. Um, and so this, this project is mostly focused on what one country could do domestically. Uh, maybe there's others. And I just want to say, um, to the extent you're worried about those, you need other law and policy instruments to address them. Um, and I think those probably are warranted, but that's not what this project is about. Um, OK, so um, the, the big challenge as I see it, um, even though uh, liability should work in theory to internalize the risk, is that the, the normal type of damages we have in tort cases are called compensatory damages, I think are gonna be inadequate to internalize the risk um, because most of the expected harm, um, at least under plausible assumptions uh, from these systems is gonna come in these tail risk scenarios um, where, uh, where compensation, or at least full compensation is not gonna be feasible. Uh, so in the in the limiting case, you know, human extinction, no one's alive to be sued to sue or be sued. Um, in an intermediate case, you know, society is sufficiently disrupted that the legal system is no longer functional. Uh, and even in a more moderate case, the harm is just so large in financial terms uh, that it's it's financially uninsurable. And so you may be able to collect something, uh, but not nearly the, the full harm that's caused. Um, and so if I'm right that most of the harm comes in the in these sorts of scenarios, it must be expected harm and expected value terms. Um, then, uh, then just internalizing 
uh, the, just assigning compensatory damages when they're feasible is going to meet uh, mean the companies expect to pay out much less um, than the amount of harm they expect to cause. And so if they're just acting on their private incentives and their profit maximizing, they're going to engage in too much risky behavior. And so if the goal of this liability framework is to, is to internalize those incentives and give them a private incentive um, to act with appropriate level of caution, um, then compensatory damages aren't going to be good enough to do that. Um, but, we, but I do think we have a solution uh, to that problem, which is punitive damages. So the... The, the primary normative rationale for punitive damages as they exist in the law now is that compensatory damages would under deter the underlying tortious activity. Um, what's different about the way I'm proposing to use them is that I'm trying to internalize risk, um, a, a, a hypothetical risk of future harm, which, which is something that isn't done with current law. So the way they're typically used is if there's a case where um, you know, maybe there's lots of people that are harmed, but it's difficult for them to sue for some reason. It's hard to prove. It's hard to trace. Um, and so you might have one case stand in for a large number. Um, this is a little different. Um, the idea uh, of, of punitive damages, as I'm posing to you, them would be to internalize the full legally compensable risk by pulling forward the expected catastrophic uh, liability into cases of practically compensable harm that are correlated with these uninsurable risks. And so what I mean there is a correlated harm is the type of harm that if uh, somebody, if a company that was building and employing these advanced AI systems expected to pay out a large punitive damages award if they caused that harm, um, the sort of measures they would take to mitigate that risk, to reduce the likelihood or severity of, of that practically compensable harm, would by default tend to mitigate uninsurable risk. I think these harms will tend to be those that, that result from alignment failures or misuse favor failures rather than uh, capabilities failures. And so the example I use in the paper is, you know, you, you, you task an AI system with uh, running a clinical trial for a risky new drug. It has trouble recruiting participants honestly. And so it resorts to some combination of deception and coercion to get people to participate instead of, you know, telling its human oversiders that it's having trouble. And, uh, you know, those people suffer nasty health effects and they sue. Uh, and so it seems like this could have gone a lot worse, clearly the system was misaligned, but for whatever reason, it was myopic, had limited situational awareness, it just had narrow goals, um, it was willing to, to sort of display its misalignment in this non-catastrophic way, but it seems like the people who chose to deploy the system probably couldn't have known that ex ante, they probably thought it was aligned or they wouldn't have deployed it, and so it, it could have produced much worse outcomes, in some sense they risked that um, when they made the decision to deploy you can contrast this with something like a capabilities failure of an autonomous vehicle, you know, running over a pedestrian because it's because its sensors failed. It wasn't trying to run over the pedestrian; it just failed at what it was trying to do. Uh, to be clear, I don't think autonomous vehicles couldn't display uh, an alignment failure if it just decided it wanted to get you where it was going as fast as possible and didn't care about your safety or the safety of people around you. Um, that might be a more correlated case that where punitive damages would be appropriate. Okay. Um, so that sounds great in theory, but I think there's some significant challenges uh, to implementing this framework that I want to be transparent about. Uh, so first, there's this technical challenge with assigning punitive damage. You need to be able to estimate how uh, like the magnitude of the risk that's generated by deploying these systems. You need to be able to estimate how correlated any particular practically compensable harm is with, um, with, with that uninsurable risk. And those seem like hard technical challenges, not insurmountable, at least to do tolerably well, but I, I do want to acknowledge that, that barrier. There's also significant legal barriers to imposing adequate punitive damages. So under current US law, punitive damages are only available in cases of intent or recklessness. I think in the typical cases we're worried about, there's unlikely to be at least human intent or recklessness. And so there's two potential avenues to root around this. Uh, one is getting the court to change this doctrine to allow um, to allow punitive damages in cases of ordinary negligence or even strict liability. I think that's a big ask, but it, it, it is warranted and it's worth pushing for. The other is treating AI systems as legal persons and, and treating them as the vehicle for liability because there might be the AI system itself might be engaging in recklessness or intentional harm. Uh, but there's some problems with that pathway because... Um, I think I think that's doctrinally more realistic, but it's um, you know when you think about the AI, AI uh, about the case of the clinical trial, was the AI system really risking anything that bad? It was risking you know some people getting side effects or maybe dying at worst. It wasn't risking anything like human extinction. It was the humans that were risking that. 
even if you if you imagine a, a case that works a little better, like a, a failed takeover attempt, maybe that does risk more catastrophic harm. Um, but there's some argument that maybe then the humans aren't vicariously liable. Um, so we have this doctrine called uh, respondeat superior, where human employees, uh, human empl employers are liable for the torts of their human employees. I think there could be a, a analogous doctrine by which you know people that deploy AI, AI systems are are liable. Um, for, for the actions of the AI system, but the, the respondeat superior doctrine says you're only liable for the torts of your employees in the scope of their employment. And so I would think an analogous thing might be the scope of deployment of an AI system. And so if a system's trying to take over the world, maybe it's exceeding its scope of deployment. Um, there's also no precedent for basing uh, punitive damages on potential future harm. So that would be a change in doctrine that would be required. And there's also under the two process clauses of the fifth and 14th amendment, um, that there, there are some limits, this, this doctrine, the, the law here is pretty fuzzy, uh, but there's some notion that there's limits on, on the ratio, the maximum ratio of punitive to compensatory damages. Some case law suggesting it, it has to be as low as, as single digits, although there are cases where it's been approved as high as 50x. Um, but I, I, you know, in the calculations I run in the paper, I think we might need multiples of, of multiple hundreds of compensatory to punitive damages to fully internalize these uninsurable risks. And so that might also be a barrier. Um, there's also legal barriers that might block liability altogether. So negligence in the sense of breach of duty might be difficult to prove. Um, you, you have to prove that, that there was some precautionary measure that the, the, the company that wanted to deploy these systems you know, failed to undertake that would, have made, that would have made sense, that would have been reasonable. I think that that's going to be tough to prove. Um, products liability, at least for, for some types of AI harms, uh, should be available. Not in theory, a strict liability, but the kind of, of strict liability that would be available uh, in, in, I think, a typical AI harm case is a design defect. And the test for design defects isn't, isn't all that strict in practice. Um, you have to prove there was a reasonable alternative design that made um, this product unreasonably unsafe. Um, and in practice, I think that's going to look a lot like a negligence analysis. Uh, there is a form of strict liability that's more strict. Um, this abnormally dangerous activity doctrine. Um, so if you could get courts to acknowledge that um, that training advanced that you know training and deploying advanced AI systems with capabilities that you can't fully predict or and behavior that you can't fully control um, is an inherently dangerous activity, and then uh, you know the, the people who deployed that system or trained it would be responsible for any harm that flowed from that inherently dangerous aspect of it. I think this would be really useful if you get courts to to apply this doctrine. Uh, but I think it would be a significant ask to get them to say that you know a, a subclass of software development is abnormally dangerous. And then finally, there's this um, this concept of proximate cause. So if uh, say I cut you off in traffic and I'm negligent, but you you slam on your brakes and we don't collide, but I slow you down 15 seconds, and then a mile down the road someone si 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 sideswipes you at an intersection, and that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have cut you off because you would have cleared the intersection before um, before that that car got there. And so in some sense, my negligence caused your injury. The law is not going to hold me liable for that because it wasn't foreseeable. It wasn't a foreseeable consequence of me cutting you off. And, um, you know, I could have just easily prevented that collision as positive. And so you could imagine in the AI context um, that even though at a high level of generality, you know, misalignment uh, harms and, and misuse uh, scenarios are foreseeable. The specific pathways that come about almost certainly won't have been foreseen and, and may arguably be, have been unforeseeable. And so a lot depends on the level of generality with which courts evaluate this, this foreseeability approximate cause question. Um, there's also this issue that under current law, um, uh, the value of someone's life to them is not, is not compensable uh, when in, in mortality cases. So there's two types of, of lawsuits that can be brought when someone dies. Uh, there's what's called a survival action that allows uh, the heirs of the, the person who died to sue for anything they could have sued the moment before they died. Uh, so if they had pain and suffering or lost wages or anything like that. And then there's uh, uh, a wrongful death action that allows uh, designated survivors to sue for, for harms they suffered as a result of the death. So if they were expecting, um, you know, uh, caretaking services or uh, financial support from the person, they could sue for that loss. Uh, but in neither of those cases is uh, is the value of the person's life to them uh, compensable. And so you might worry that, you know, most of the harm from AI may be deaths, and that's going to result in, in undercompensation, under deterrence. In the limiting case where, you know, causes human extinction, aside from the practical concerns, 
about enforcing liability judgment, uh, the, the liability might actually be zero. because There's no one around to have to be suffering from uh, from the loss of consortium or loss of, of you know material support. OK, um, we might also worry that there's not enough of these warning shots or correlated harm cases to feasibly internalize catastrophic risk externalities. If that's true, I think this form framework just doesn't work. Um, uh, there's also uh, some harms that aren't legally compensable. So I think it's only realistic that you're going to you're going to internalize the risk of legally compensable harm. So stuff like political disinformation, I think you're going to need other policy tools to deal with. Um, and one more you might have is that liability comes too late to, to affect the most important choices, particularly if we're in if we're in fast takeoff scenarios that you're not going to get these cases in time that's influencing important choices. OK. Um, so in the paper, what I do is I lay out sort of what existing tort law, business as usual, uh, extrapolation of existing tort doctrines, how, how much that would uh, limit AI risk. I think it would, it would get us some deterrence power, but pretty limited. And then I map out uh, what doctrinal moves courts could make within their common law powers if they take AI risk seriously. Um, so they could allow punitive damages even for, for ordinary negligence or strict liability, allow them to account for future potential harms. They could, as I said, recognize training and deploying of AI systems as an abnormally dangerous activity that's eligible for a really strict form of strict liability. They could apply a broad conception of foreseeability to approximate cause analysis so that, that that's not a significant barrier. And they can allow uh, damages to account for the full value of lost lives. So all those are pretty straightforward steps. Um, then there's further steps I think legislatures could take um, if, if they take this problem seriously uh, while, while still acting within this tort liability framework. So there's two two big ones that I think clearly would be beneficial. One is just announcing the policy in advance, so we don't have this problem. You have to wait for a case. The way that you know common law courts typically work is they don't have any mechanism to announce their policies in advance. Um, they they just decide a case. They write an opinion explaining why they decided it that way, and that's how you know it's going to happen in the next case. It seems like that's not going to be good enough if we're if we're in a moderately test fast takeoff world. Um, could also require liability insurance that scales with model capabilities. Um, this would bring another decision maker into the loop, another uh, you know sort of break on on reckless action. It would also put less pressure on the the punitive damages framework um, by making more cases practically compensable. Um, these other two, I'm I'm less sure are good ideas. You could shift jurisdiction over uh, over AI harms to an expert agency instead of a court. I think there's trade offs there that I can get into in the Q and A. And um, you know if you're going to have huge punitive damages award, maybe they don't all need to go to the plaintiff. You might want a large amount to go to motivate these lawsuits, um, but maybe beyond a certain point, you want to divert that to some kind of AI safety fund. And I think that's uh, that's worth consideration. Um, okay, so I want to close with discussion. I'm sure there's some, some technical AI safety people here and, and how they can help contribute to this project if they think it's useful. Um, so the first is, is I put up this equation on the screen for how I think punitive damages should be calculated. Um, so you've got um, the uh, N, which is the, the sort of total harm uh, you expect uh, a system to cause. You've got this uh, CP divided by CT, uh, which is like the share um, uh, of punitive damages that are, are should be assigned for this particular uh, system, um, the, the share of expected harm that this particular system uh, is causing compared to, sorry, this is the share of all liability, practically compensable harm that, 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 that is, happens in this case versus all total expected harm. Uh, this practically compensable, and then the, the the second EP and EA are these uh, elasticity parameters. So it's the relative elasticity of um, of this particular harm to the average practically compensable harm caused by the system, and this is a measure of sort of how correlated um, this particular harm is uh, with with these uninsurable risks compared to average. And you should weight by that. Um, and so the idea here is to internalize the full risk. I can get into more of that in Q and A, um, but I think uh, technically, I see safety people could help in estimating these parameters. Um, I also think they could help in crafting evaluations for models that could be used by regulators to set liability insurance requirements and by insurance companies to set premiums. I also think evaluations could be used um, to estimate the underlying risk generated by these systems, um, which uh, would be necessary for the end parameter in this. Um, they can also develop arguments to persuade courts and regulators to take AI risk seriously, which would you know, motivate them to adopt these different, these different proposals that I'm advocating for. And so with that, I'm happy to, to address questions. Thank you, Gabe. You've done it well before time.
I have uh, two questions for you. So Madhav asks, could we get around problems of proving recklessness, intent, or negligence by adding preemptive clauses to licensing regimes? For example, with the EU AI Act's risk clauses for AI models, they might tell a developer, during the pre-deployment phase of your AI model, if conditions A, B, C occur, we'll find you some amount. On gaining approval for deployment, if conditions D and F occur, we'll find you some other amount. Yeah, so I think that would be moving away from a tort liability framework. There's certainly other sort of uh, penalty regimes you could work with. I think the advantage of, of sort of a system that relies on actual harm occurring is that, um, you know, e even under the framework that I'm proposing, there's going to be a lot of debate about what the underlying risk was. Um, and figuring out how to assign those punitive damage liability, but at least you've seen that the system, um, you know, was 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 showing behavior that it wasn't supposed to in a way that was actually harmful. Um, but I think that's certainly something that should be considered that that uh, to get around some of the problems that, that that I raised and to get at maybe sorts of harms that aren't aren't legally compensable. Um, and so I think that's open to consideration, but that's sort of beyond the scope of what tort liability can do. Cool, thanks. Madhav also has another question, which is, I'm only just now realizing that costs for AI harms seem reactive, even if they might incentivize proactive efforts. What else can we do to internalize negative external externality costs at earlier phases of AI model development? Do you have thoughts? Yeah, so they are reactive in the sense that they only get paid out once the harm actually happens. Uh, the idea, though, is that you create the expectation of liability and that aligns the ex ante incentives. Um, so I think I think that isn't necessarily, especially if you require liability insurance and you can't deploy the model um, unless you can afford a liability insurance policy. And, you know, so you've got an insurance uh, company in the loop that has to sign off. Um, I think that does provide you a lot of risk mitigation. Um, it, the, the problem with trying to apply it ex ante is you have to, you know, you have to have some way of knowing how risky a model is before it's done anything wrong. You know, we have evaluations that we can use to try to say um, whether you should deploy a model, but the, the problem is we're worried that those aren't good enough, right? If we were able to fully quantify the risk ex ante, then we could more prescriptively regulate and say what systems are allowed to, 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 um, to deploy. And, I, and the concern I have is that we don't know how to build safe systems. We don't really know how to tell whether systems are safe. And so, you know, you could have, you know, we try to think, oh, well, we need need some sort of uh, AI risk tax that works like a, a carbon tax that does work before any harm has happened. Um, and I just think figuring out what the tax should be for any uh, for any given model seems pretty intractable. Uh, and you know, obviously, I I know there's some technical challenges with, with calculating what punitive damages should be uh, uh, within my framework. But I think the the, the technical challenges they are much more tractable than they would be for for something like an AI risk tax. Cool. Yeah. Um, we have some more time as part of your thirty minutes. Is there some maybe uh, part of your slides that you might want to? Yeah, sure. Let me on. pull those back up. Okay, so I can say a couple things uh, that I went through quickly. So, yeah. So, so I think. In terms of, of what what asks here are realistic to make from courts, um, I think the the biggest uh, the, the biggest barrier here is going to be this idea that uh, punitive damages are allowed for ordinary negligence or strict liability. It would be hard to limit the effect of this doctrinal change um, to just AI. It would have a pretty widespread effect across all of tort law. Um, I think it's a change that makes sense when you think through the normative rationale for um, for punitive damages. It doesn't really make sense that it should be limited um, to cases of malice or recklessness. If if the if the, um, the compensatory damages are under deterring the underlying tortious activity, that seems like that should be the test. 
Um, and so I think on the merit, this is warranted, but it is a big change that courts haven't been moved to make in other contexts. And so I, I'm skeptical that's going to happen. Um, and so if that doesn't, I think that's a major barrier to implementing this. I went through the sort of alternative theory of uh, AI, the AI system as the, the sort of vessel for liability. But as I said, there's some significant problems with that pathway. And so if courts aren't willing to do this and just, you know, also you could have legislation that allows punitive damages, um, any of the, that, that's a point worth being clear about. Um, any of the things that I say courts could do on their own could also be done by legislation. Um, the only thing that, that legislation couldn't do um, is, is get by this due process problem that I raised around uh, punitive damages. So if, if the US Supreme Court says, that uh, punitive damages multiples um, above a certain level are gonna be unconstitutional. Legislation can't change that directly at least. Um, in theory, you could, you could provide for legislation that, that gives more notice and then the Supreme Court might say that's constitutional because you're, you're, you're giving a notice that's required for due process. Um, but all these other doctrinal moves that the common law courts could make, um, those could also be done by state legislatures. And so I think um, for people who wanna be more in, in sort of legal and policy advocacy, um, state legislatures are where you would you would sort of make all of the pitch for a lot of these things. I think there, there's less, you know, mechanisms. You could, you know, submit amicus briefs in, in, in state court cases. But I think if we want to be proactive before there's a case that comes forward. I think state legislation uh, to make a lot of these doctrinal changes, to make it clear that uh, punitive damage are going to be available, that, that, that genuine strict liability on something like an abnormally dangerous activity doctrine is going to be available. Uh, that you know, I think it would be harder to write legislation that would uh, that would that would address this foreseeability analysis and proximate cause. But uh, people can think about about ways that that could be structured, and, and even uh, on on you know methods for valuating uh, for for valuing mortality damages. Uh, so those are already statutes, both the, the wrongful death statutes and and survival action statutes, and so those could be modified to allow uh, compensation for the value of the decedent's life to them. That the theory right now for why that why that isn't compensable is you, you know you can't um, you know you you can't benefit you can't genuinely be compensated for your death you're no longer alive uh, but that only goes to the the sort of compensatory function of tort law there's also the deterrence function that I'm more focused on in, in this project and so to the extent that's what you're worried about it's really important um, that that full value be be internalized um, trying to think through other things I wanted to emphasize. Yeah, so point five here about warning shots. I think if it's true that we're not going to get those warning shots, that this framework just doesn't work, I don't think there's any solution to that. Um, but I think in that world, this problem is just much harder and we need to be uh, you know, reaching for more more radical tools and we need to, to think through what those look like. Uh, but that's just a really hostile world to be in. I think the rest of these challenges are you know, political, legal, technical. They are surmountable and... Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to say that there that there are things that we can't navigate around. Um, some of them are, are bigger challenges than others, um, but I think these are all these are all things that people should be working on, um, either persuading people to change or doing the technical work uh, to figure out, um, you know, how to how to how to uh, overcome them. Uh, I guess I should go back to this this technical uh, calculation since I don't I don't think I explained it that clearly the first time around. Um, so, so S is, is, is what the punitive, the share of punitive damages that should go to the plaintiff in, in any particular case. Um, N is the total harm that you would expect to be caused by this system. And then uh, the CP to CT ratio, uh, what I'm trying to cap capture here, this is the plaintiff's share of the total compensatory damages that you, that you would expect to be available for the harms caused by this system. So if it's, if it's, if it's harming multiple people in ways that will be uh, practically recoverable, um, then, then, then P is the plaintiff's share, CT is the total. Um, um, and then these, these elasticities, the idea here is if you, if you spend resources trying to mitigate um, the, the, the likelihood or severity of a particular harm, um, how much uh, for the plaintiff is EP, how much will that mitigate uninsurable risk compared to how much if you try to mitigate the average harm, um, practically compensable harm, how much would that uh, mitigate uninsurable risk? What's, what's the ratio of, you know, so you, of how much uh, reduction in the risk of practically compensable harm to uninsurable risk for each? 
Um, and so the, the, the higher that is for the, for the plaintiff's harm relative to average, the larger the share of the punitive damages they should get. And the point is you're trying to optimize um, for putting the deterrence power on the cases uh, where a large damage award is most likely to encourage, um, or the expectation of a large damage award is most likely to encourage the kinds of precautionary measures um, that would, in fact, tend to, to mitigate the uninsurable risk, which is really the goal of these punitive damages. Uh, I'll give another chance for a question. Yeah, I think that's your time. Uh, thank you very much, Gabe, for that talk, and everybody for joining.